Welcome to Investing on Purpose, the show about making your money matter. On this show, you'll be introduced to emerging trends and entrepreneurs who are creating change through business. Join JP and I every week as we explore how to use our money to create an impact and make the world a better place. Now onto the show. Ryan Moran, it is so great to have you here on a Sunday morning with some coffee. Good to see you, JP, as always. It's terrific. You know, Ryan, it's been fun because in our relationship, a lot of times we're talking about my real estate deals and things like that. And today, let's like switch our hats. I love to talk to you about actually interview you because you have something very exciting going on right now with a deal that I've known you've been working on for six months. It's intensely personal to you. It feels like six years. It does feel like six years. I've watched you through the ups and downs. And then last week you looked at me and said, I think this is going to happen. And I saw you light up and we've had many iterations of it. So for today's show, I thought for investing on purpose, I just thought it'd be such a great conversation, not only to dig into the current deal that you're working on, but also the why and the mission. And then how does it fit in? Because I know we've been brainstorming back and forth of how this could be an incredible model for the new kind of finance and the new kind of structures that are out there that really kind of take both purpose and profit and weave it together beautifully in new ways. And I know you're already jamming down that rabbit hole, as I would expect you would. And I, I appreciate that because this really does feel like an opportunity to practice that muscle. Yes. I, I feel I feel like, I mean, I consider you a mentor and I, I watch how you operate in business with that intention. And I think there was a transition for you somewhere in your career where it stopped being about money and started more being about intent. It's still about money and profit. You have to, but it's become more about intent and purpose and legacy. And for me, this is kind of my opportunity to start to flex that muscle. I love it. And We've talked about it and I see you doing it and this is great. It's still about profit. Right. It's still about growth. It's still an entrepreneurial venture, but I feel like this is an opportunity for me to start to build that muscle. It is. And you, you know, in the last couple episodes, we've talked about this idea that they're really synonymous, right? That that the, you can actually be more profitable while having that intent and that passion and that mission baked in and probably create better results. That's been my experience, as you know, with Thrive FP is actually creating higher outcomes, better outcomes for my investors by simply having intention and focus um, built in, baked into the cake. Yeah, you can only get so far being selfish. Yeah. And you can get kind of far. Like you can become a millionaire being selfish, but yeah. you, you don't really break out or do something special until other people value it more than you do, until you're creating it for other people. I, I totally agree. Also, I can just tell you now, seeing so many entrepreneurs, I, I was actually at a car rally this weekend, and there was a lot of people with a lot of fancy cars and a lot of money. And when I sit down and spoke to them, it was very interesting, the mix of people who kind of are just making as much money as possible, but there is no mission in it, mm -hmm. versus the one or two there that maybe we're trying for something more. Most of them, quite honestly, were just there to make as much money and be as extractive as possible. And I don't see joy. I just see a lot of cars. Huh. That's interesting. I saw a lot of cars, a lot of talk about cars. But when I was trying to like bring the conversations to like them personally, it got right back to what I have as opposed to who I am. I'm I'm actually baffled by that. I, I was too. To be honest, I was baffled by it. I'm. I guess I just assume that once you reach a certain amount of wealth, it starts to switch. There's mm -mm. diminishing returns. No. I mean, I think, I think it has for both of us. Yeah. Right. And I have made millions and lost millions and made it back and lost it. Like I've, I've ridden that roller coaster. Right. And the things that always work out are the ones that have meaning and purpose and contribution. Yeah. So I, I guess I just assumed that once you've done that roller coaster a few times, you sort of learn the lesson. Yeah. But I want to be hearing you say is that isn't necessarily the case. It's not. I, I get it. Like this week, I was actually hard to keep. The, I was trying hard to be a good conversationalist, but it was actually <laughs> quite hard to keep. Yeah, we're trying to one up each other. And by the way, you can always one up each other with things. And who wants to play that game? Some guy was telling me he's got three safes full of watches and he just he just like. He just likes to collect watches and he can't wear them all. So like, how many watches do you want? Sounds awful. How many bottles of wine do you need? <laughs> how many planes do you need? And, and some, I'm, I'm not downing. That's great if yeah. you want that. But but it's not going to be joy if you don't have the other part, which is the love, the connection, the community and everything else. The like, contribution. Yeah. Contribution. The, the, just the happiness, the happiness of it all. The fulfillment yeah. of it all. It's not It's not the, the watches won't do it. It won't, it won't, the clicks and the, the clicks of the watches won't do it. That's, I'm, I'm honestly surprised, JP. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. genuinely it's surprised. Good. It, it's good. People think a lot of things happen as you get older. Like, you, you know, I will be more generous when I'm older and have the money. I will be happier when I get older and have the money. If I just had the money 
And I can just tell you in this journey that I've been on, I'm just not seeing it. Huh. That's really interesting. Well, for, for me on this deal, I'm, I'm pursuing this because it gets all of the feels of the excitement and the contribution. And like, that's what gets, it's giving me juice. Yes. And I, it will make money. But the thing is JP, this is the first experience I've had where I know it's going to be successful in some way. Yeah. Not because of the numbers, but because how I feel about it. Yes. Which is a total 180 to how I'm used to even, even how I've operated from when I met you, yeah, right? it was more, I would logically conclude if something was g- going to be successful, if it made sense, and then I would try and work my own emotions and energy and thoughts into it to make it work. Yeah, And I just found that that didn't work for me. Whereas this deal, you know, knock on wood, I think will be successful because I'm jazzed about it. Like I, I, I have, it's giving me energy to think about it and to work on it rather than the opposite. And that's why I think it will work. So let's talk about it. So let's start from the beginning. A lot of people, maybe some people know, some people don't. Share strength, yeah. which was your baby. Can you talk a little bit about share strength? And I think answers the second part of your your acquisition. Can you talk about how it birthed, what happened to it, and the potential rebirth under Ryan Moran? Yeah, in 2000, I think it was 2013, I started a supplement company with my business partner, Matthew. And he and I both were like six-figure entrepreneurs. We, we each made maybe... 150 grand a year yeah. We're doing doing awesome as 25 year olds amazing and we started this company together really for ourselves we started a a, a workout company we were we're both like wannabe bros want, want, we wanted to build muscle <laughs> you know so we, we started a company around the products that we wanted to have for ourselves and the company was very successful over the course of four years we took it to about a 10 million dollar run right. rate if i remember the, the kind of supplements you were doing had to do with Health, like was it, yeah. was it was it a supplement for for people going to the gym or was it general health? Or it was it was pre workouts, nitric oxide, testosterone boosters, protein powders, creatine. Got it. Post workouts, it was exercise supplements for the most part. Got it. And so we you got us to ten million in, in sales. Correct. Okay. In, at, per year. Wow. So we it took us four years to get there. It was very successful. We had a great relationship, great partnership, and we were starting to struggle with the team building side of things. We could never get past about a team of four. We were young and just had our first multi-million dollar business. And in 2017, we partnered with a private equity group and sold a majority stake of, of the business. And that was a huge financial win for me, huge financial win for Matt. And it also was the opportunity to see how you build a company bigger than $10 million. Right. Because we were struggling with that infrastructure piece. We didn't know how to take it from 10 to 100. And they were very confident that they could scale it to 50 or $100 million. That did not happen. <laughs> yeah. The absolute opposite happened. I watched them run this company into the ground. Wow. And very quickly so. And some of it was n- not their fault, but a lot of it was decisions they made and people they hired that had no business being in the business. So it wasn't necessarily the private equity group's fault, but they also brought people in charge that ran the company into the ground. And so that business went bankrupt. The business that I sold. How quickly did that happen? How did it go from 10 million to bankrupt? Did that happen in what period of time? I think it was two and a half years, Yeah, two to two and a half years. And and the story really quickly is we had $3 million in EBITDA when we sold. Mm And then they brought on leverage, brought on debt to buy the company. And so they were making, I think, $100,000 a month in interest payments. Wow. To, to, so to, one, of the, one of the lessons, they over leveraged too quickly. Yeah, well, they did. Yeah. So that's $1 million gone per right, year. Right. And then they paid themselves a management fee. Okay, I see. And then they hired an executive from PepsiCo, a retired executive from PepsiCo who had never been in the supplement company and never run an online business. Right. They brought him on and then he hired a director of sales that had no business anyway. Yes. <laughs> and then they hired a CFO and they hired a project manager. And so that was another million dollars of the EBITDA gone. So they, they, they were spending like a $50 million company when, when they, they were, they, they sounds like they came out of the gate unprepared Wrong alignment of the wrong wrong skills 
I'm too much too much leverage right, right out the gate. Well, uh, some of it is what you're supposed to do as a as a private equity group. You're supposed to buy a business with profits and then reinvest the profits into building a team. But they hired the wrong people. Gotcha. And and as a result of that, the company shrank. And so you go from a $3 million EBITDA to a $1.8 million EBITDA, but now you have $400,000 in loss right. because of interest payments and all these other things. And it becomes a spiral that was never able to recover. And so they declared bankruptcy in, in I, I think it was 2019, so about about two years after acquisition. Can I ask you one question before yeah. you go on? So on that, like if you were to give someone advice that you've been through this, when you were dating private equity and you chose them, what do you think you've learned in hindsight? Like, is there anything you could have seen before you did the deal with them? Now that you've been on, now that you've seen both sides of them, that you could have recognized that this is not the right fit, or is oh this yeah, just, I, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it. I, we had we had a check waved in front of us. I was right. twenty nine years old, right? Right. <laughs> you know, I'm, right. I'm twenty nine years old, right. and I have a ten million dollar check more uh, between my, you know, split between Matt and myself, right? You know, I, 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 it's hard to say no to gotcha. that. Gotcha. Gotcha. But, but the the thing was. It, it was kind of like being on The Bachelor. You you accept a rose, and then you accept another rose, and then it gets down to final four, and you go through due diligence, right. and you provide all this documentation, and then you're at the end of the process, and there's some red flags, but you've done all this work right. to get to this point, right. and if you just complete it, there's $5 million in I, there for you. Yeah, so, yeah. so I wish that I had spent as much time vetting them as they had betting me. I think it's a great, by the, I've had the same experience time and time again, that whenever I would get lazy because I was wishful or hopeful that it would just be fine and not taking that diligence, it's bought me, it's definitely bit, bit me on the ass before. So I understand that. And I, and I want to be clear the the group that we sold to had some really great people there. They had some really kind, good natured people there, but they had never been in this industry before. Right. And they, the people that they brought on in charge, I should have vetted them too. But because right. they had past successes in other industries and because I had never been in the private equity group world before, it was like, I mean, you guys know better than me, right? Right? You know how to go to $50 million, right? And so the biggest thing I learned from that, JP, was I might be good at this. I might actually be good at business. Maybe yeah. I'm better than I thought. Yeah. Maybe building a $3 million profit company is pretty cool. Right. It takes skill. Maybe I wasn't all luck. Maybe Matt and I are good at this. So uh, to, to make this story a little bit shorter, I tried to buy the company out of bankruptcy in 2019. And unfortunately, the bank that foreclosed on the assets sold it to another private equity group. And so they, they didn't choose me. They chose another private equity group that they thought could recover some of the losses. I remember this, yeah. And that didn't happen either. Yeah. The, the group that bought it, um, they they did things that were smarter. They did things that had worked for other businesses before, but it didn't work within that particular business. And so I have the opportunity to buy the assets wow. again. Fast forward. So fast forward today, I have the, the opportunity to buy the assets and I, not, it looks good. Like- yeah. Full disclosure: the deal is not done. We're not air. If if this is, if, we're, if, we're, if you're we're, hearing this right now, the deal's probably done. Right, right? one way or the other, <laughs> the deal is done. Yeah, and we'll report on what happened. But at the time of this recording, it's not done. And I, I'm I'm hoping it goes through, but I'm also detached from the process. Yeah, and I'm really excited, not for the results that I think it will bring me, but for the process of resurrecting this brand that I have a lot of energy for and the vision that I have for it's very different than the vision than what I built back in 2013 because I'm different. The company is different. The marketplace is different, but I'm more excited now than I was in 2013 when I started. And Ryan, can I make one observation just to start on this, yeah. this like transformation? I know six months ago, I think right when we were in Utah, you got a phone call that this company from the second bank may be for sale again. Yes. And I think they threw out a number at you. And actually, I remember what the number is, uh, but then they, they, they basically said, and you got excited by the idea of being able to maybe resurrect this company. Your yes. baby can be resurrected. And I said to you, I said, right at the time, maybe that's the right price. Maybe it isn't because I couldn't see who else they would sell it to. Yes. One of the things I think you've also learned, Ryan, as you talk about this is when I saw you last week, um, the price that 
you negotiated is a much better price than the first price they threw out you. And I think part of what you realized is the value that you bring to it. Right. As excited as you were to bring it back and resurrect your baby, I think you also, this detachment that you're talking about is a really great business skill. I've said, I want this, but I don't have to have it. And by doing that, then you're not like, you don't have to get with their price. You actually change the dynamics where now you're going to get it on your terms rather than their terms. Yeah, so let, let's let's unpack that a little bit because that was an interesting transformation. So when we were in Utah and I got the price, I was ready to pay that price. But at that time, I was still thinking about how I could do it. I was thinking about how much I would pay for it, how I would fix the company, how what my vision would be. I was really thinking about the effort that I was going to put into it, including the capital that I was going to put into it. And I was ready to do it. When the energy and the optimism wore off and the reality kicked in, I realized I did not have the capacity to commit to all of that. I could not do this deal if I did not have an operator. I could not do this deal if I did not have investors because I'm not. I'm in a place right now where I could fund the deal, but it would make me feel scarce. Yeah. I would be worried about the money rather than growing a vision. And so I realized that I couldn't do the deal on my own. So I said no to the deal. I said, I cannot pursue this right now. And that is when I started reaching out to potential partners. I didn't, I didn't turn, I didn't delete the deal from my brain. I just said, if you, if you need to find another buyer, I understand. I am not in the position capacity wise to be able to do it in the way that I thought I could. And that forced me to get creative, but it also helped me uncover that I was indeed bringing a lot of value to the table because I was bringing in the vision. I was bringing in the skill set. I was bringing in the people and the network and the ideas. And that this company was only going to succeed with those things. Fantastic. It's what a, what a realization from the 29 year old. That's great. That was, it was a big realization. Yeah. It, it helped me value my time, but most importantly, value my energy. Because the way I was viewing it up in, even when we were excited in Utah together, I was viewing it as I'm going to work really hard. I saw that. And it was from a bit of an egoic place. Like I will correct the wrongs that happened in the past. I will, I will fix this story. I will make mm. up for the value that I didn't get paid because I was still owed money. Right. That, that got bankrupted. And I, I, I will do something about this. And that energy was a very effortful energy. And I just don't have a lot of that right now. I don't have the grind energy. So what changed? What transformed for you? Well, what changed was I said no, and other people started stepping up Ah. saying, no, I want to be part of this. That's great. You changed your energy of not needing to do it, taking your ego out of it, kind of relaxing and then the universe kind of responded. That's right. This is the this is the big aha, JP. The more that I stuck to the lane where I create a lot of value, the more that the other gaps started to fill in naturally. Because I know that I can raise the capital and build an amazing vision for these companies. I know that I can I, I know that I can bring spirit and creativity to this. And I know I can rally other people to get excited about this. But if I'm expected to operate it, I will mess it up. Yeah, it's not, you're, you're sticking in your lane of your strength. That's right. Not your weaknesses. That's right. And so I, it taught me that if I stick to that lane and I stay in that zone, that I can create partnerships right. with the other people who can fill in the gaps. By the way, let's just, let's just declare what that zone is because I know what it is. Yeah. How would you describe the zone to the audience? Like what, 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 is, your, what is your lane in your zone where you're really – in your personal genius. You know, I once took some entrepreneurial personality test that said, what kind of an entrepreneur are you? Yeah. And I was primary a star and secondary an investor. Mm. And that has me nailed. A star is a front stage guy. I, I, if there is a stage, put me on it. If there's a microphone, put me in front of it. If there's a camera, turn it on. I, I am <laughs> gotcha. a front stage guy. And I don't belong backstage. Right. I don't belong... I, I shouldn't tell you what to do with the lights and the sets. Right. I will show up in front of the microphone and I will give a speech. Right. And it will sound like I planned it. You right. Know, I, that, that is why I belong. I, be, I, I became an entrepreneur because I wanted to pursue performing. That's great. That's, that's, I, I totally get that. So, so that, that's one. And then investor is looking at deals and packaging it and producing it. And when, when I play 
when I play a video game, my favorite video game is Madden, but I don't even play the games. I just build the team. Mm -hmm. You know, I I, want to I want to own the Cleveland Guardians because I want to trade players and sign free agents. I get it. So so I I am the star slash investor, but I do not belong in the operating room. Yeah. One of the beautiful things you've done there, Ryan, I've watched it, you know, is you've also put together an incredible team and network. So the team in your office is obviously a very capable team. And I've watched you hire one by one, just keep like put the pieces together, which has also been a success of mine at Thrive is, you know, I have a 20 person team and it's just been one person at a time. And that's incredible. And having a network where you have phone calls from like, you're getting these phone calls from CEOs, like, you know, that have been successful. The fact that you have access and you've taken the time to build it really puts you, it, it lets you be that star and that investor but then have all the right pieces to, to really right. create success. That's right. And every single person that is coming to the table from this deal came from me staying in that zone of genius. For example, the CEO that I met, I met because I'm producing content around business. And that put me into the network where he became a connection. Right. And my investing partner, who we both know, Sam, he came into my world because he was on my podcast several times. And the reason why sheer strength was successful, first, I had an amazing partner in Matt, but also me creating content and going out and networking opened up relationships with people who mentored us or got us into retail stores. That's how I met our retail broker. And me staying in that lane created the opportunities for me to then play the secondary role of bringing in the pieces. Yes, that's That is my genius. That's what I'm good at. And if I stay in that lane, then I'm able to meet the investors who want to put up the capital or the operator who wants to be a part of this or the young, hungry entrepreneur who wants a shot at working with me. And so he takes a small equity position in the company at a, at a discounted salary to work really hard to be a part of this. Makes that, sense. That, that's that's where I bring value. So Ryan, let me ask you a question. You're, you're now, um, you know, we're talking about share strength 2.0, we'll call it. Yeah. Um, you see a lot of deals every day. You're, you, you have your own fund and you guys are doing deals. So I guess I'm going to ask you, if it's not ego, if, if you're not doing sure strength out of ego to prove that you can do it, I'm going to ask you what's your think about what your new why why do this when there's so many other things you could be doing. I know one of the things you mentioned to me is you might even do like a longevity brand and really focus yes, on like. Right. So can you tell me a little more about just kind of what's your mindset of of, of 2.0? And the mission and why behind 2.0 of share strength. Full disclosure, there is definitely ego in this deal. Okay. I mean, 100%, I have a chip on my shoulder. 100%, (laughs) I want to show that I can still do this and that I can bring this company back to like 100%, there is that. I would just say that this time there's a healthy amount of that, not a distracting amount of that. I, I I have enough ego in it to where it's like I'm hungry. Like I want it. But I don't have enough ego to say that this can't fail. Right. I don't have enough ego to say that I shouldn't be mindful about this or that investors shouldn't vet it. Right. I I am aware of the marketplace conditions and but but yes, I there's there is a part of me that is driven by some so, ego. So we'll continue. I want to yeah, hear more because I want to hear more about that. But tell me but, more about the why. But but also in in 2013 when I started the business. I started it around the idea of I'm a wannabe bro. I'm developing a a brand for wannabe bros. And that was our customer base. Today, I'm not that person. It's 10 years later. Wow. It's 10 years later. I'm a dad of two now. I don't want to be a bro. I want to be a healthy dad and eventually a healthy grandpa who runs around with his grandkids. I want to age well. um, I want to... I want to live to be a hundred and still have abs, you yeah. know, like I, I, I want to be that. And so, so the idea of aging well and being, having strength for life is, is much more compelling to me than, than having 30 inch arms. Right. And, and so this brand needs a new vision. It needs a new direction and it will reflect the desire to have strength for life, to age well, to be a longevity brand, to, to be fit. And so, Part, part of the brand is, is, I think one of the taglines we're going to have is from dad bod to father figure. Mm, and wow. I think we're going to write a book 
So I've I'll, I'll I love that I plan on extending a, an offer to um, our doctor. Yes, that uh, that is one of the you know most renowned biohacker doctors in uh, in in the country, and I think we will write a book together called From Dad Bod to Father Figure. That's great, and it will be about hormone optiz- hormone optimization and how epigenetics impact your health, and it will be a- about engineering the the modern male leader and doing that in a healthy way and instilling that physically and mentally and spiritually. And that will be the book that acquires customers that sells people into our supplements, which will no longer be about just adding muscle, but about longevity and health and uh, even mental health perhaps. Yeah. And so it will be a, it will be, it will be for me for the next 20 years rather than the me of 10 years ago. I think and, it's fantastic. And that's the transformation. Of and the that brain. also, I think when you talk about the brain and your ego, when you talk about the old ego versus the new ego, and I appreciate you, you know, saying I've still got ego on this, but, but that makes total sense to me because you're not trying to like bring the old man back. You're trying to make new songs. Yeah. Yeah. You know that's what right. I mean? It's that's not right. like you're trying to like, you're not, you're not like yearning for an earlier day of when you're saying I have a new vision. And by the way, I went mountain biking last week. And I now have friends, Ryan, from 28 to 75. I have a very, you'll see when you hit your 50s, you kind of have this like book. I go 20 years both directions. And so the guys I was mountain biking with, one was 61 and one was 73. And we were shredding. Wow. Shredding, jumping off rocks. And like my buddy, my 73-year-old, who's like my guru for 20, two hours a day of meditation. Then he just jumps off things (laughs) and drives his motorcycle at about 145 miles an hour. And just, he's like, really is that motorcycle Buddha. And, um... It was a great flash of what you're saying. Like I would have never imagined in my childhood having a 73 year old friend who would shred most 20 year olds. <laughs> I mean, just shred them. So I love that vision, and I know you and I do share the same doctor because I think you know that is the ultimate goal. It it is really staying vital, healthy, alive, and keeping your body so you can stay active and ski until your 70s. That's right. 80s and do all those things. Which really, with the quality, you know, I think a lot of people say, "Well, how long do you want to live?" And I think it's the wrong question. I think it's how well can you live yes. during those years? That's more important than how long you live with chronic disease or who wants to be 110 degrees if you're if you're falling apart and, in a and just nursing think, home. Think about the examples that we can set for the next generation about middle aged men. Mm-hmm. I mean, even that phrase "middle aged men," yeah, we think of Homer Simpson, right? But what an opportunity to reframe the way that we think about middle-aged men. Yeah. And I'm 34. Yeah. I'm like right on the cusp of middle age. Oh, not. You're, <laughs> right. you're a child. Okay. I, I'm your definition. Okay. Well, when I was a kid, 35 to 40 was like, you're middle-aged right. now. Right, right, right. And, and that's changing and that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. But what an opportunity to usher in this new understanding of what that 35 to 75 looks like yes. and how healthy you can be and the example that we can set for, this is what male leaders look and act and feel like. Yeah. That, that, that is way bigger than a supplement company, yeah. JP. Yeah. Like that, that, like that's a vision. Yeah. I'm so pumped up talking love, about this I right now. I love it. I love and, it. And just, just to, to mention something, you know, there is a second company that we're acquiring in this deal and that has a very different demographic, a demographic that I'm not a part of at all, but it has just as much meaning to that celebrity influencer. Yeah. She, she wants to impact that demographic and leave a legacy with those individuals. And because of that, there's just as much juice. And so what we have the opportunity to do is be an example of two supplement companies that have a real deep purpose by serving a very specific demographic. And that, that's my entire thesis of when I'm working with an entrepreneur. It's who is the person and how do we go all in on serving that person? That's how you build a multi-million dollar business, by creating a brand that serves that person relentlessly. And I get to do that for myself as the person and for somebody else that is a dream person for me to work with, somebody that I grew up watching yeah. that is now going to have the same type of impact, but in her demographic. It's fantastic. I'm pumped, man. A, I'm I, pumped. I feel your energy, brother. It's I'm good. I'm just stoked. So Ryan, while we're on this, this, this kind of su- subject of really serving the audience, let's talk about, I know in the last few episodes of Investing on Purpose, we really talked about this revolution in, in DeFi. I believe it's going to be as big as the internet was to communication yes. and commerce. We are on the 
early, early edges of what this definance revolution is going to be with all these two new technologies, these NFTs, the crypto, crowdsourcing, all these new technologies. And I know we've been going down the rabbit hole. Have you thought much? I know we've talked just a little bit about it, but as you have these great new companies, you are the encapsulation of the entrepreneur that has a new company that's la launching. And now there's new tools and structures out there to potentially structure these companies differently than maybe you could have five years ago or yeah. even three years ago. Have you put thought into that and what might it look like um, under these new structures? Yeah, I've, I have started to think about this. So the first and like the, the fastest way that this will show up is when I go to raise the capital for this business, I will have some sort of Web3 aspect to it. So the way that that might look is, first of all, I'm launching an investor group at capitalism.com, my primary company. I'm launching an investor group where I'm bringing all of my deal flow that I get from my fund, from my audience, from my incubator, and giving those investors the first the first opportunity to invest in any of those opportunities. And the way that you will get access to that investor group is you'll buy an NFT. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll have a very small group of probably be 200 or less to start, but those 200 people will get all the deal flow. And if they ever decide they, they're full on investments or they don't wanna be a part of the group anymore, they would just sell their access to someone else. So the investor group will have an, an asset that gives them access to my deal flow. Super cool. It's good for me because it's an easy sell. There's very little downside to buying the NFT. Right. It's a great opportunity for the investor because they're going to get deal flow and be a part of a network of other investors. Right. And it's great for the deals I'm bringing to the table because I'll always have a few hundred people that are ready and paying attention to deploy capital. To deploy capital, right? It's so great. it just it it wins all the way. Well, there's around. one more piece too. Some liquidity, like like the way Gary V has been doing his token. It's actually gone up in value. Yeah. You actually have an equity that not only are you investing, but has the potential to appreciate just by the value of those services That's alone. Right. And, and, and you can trade them. If you decide you're interested or not interested, it's transferable in a very right. clean way. So I am now incentivized to bring the best deal flow possible to that group to drive up the value of the asset. Right. So, so instead of it being I'm incentivized to sell as many of them as possible, I'm incentivized to do a great job yes. for my for my customers, which are the investors in this case. So that's part one. I, I will I will bring investment opportunities like this, or maybe this one specifically, depending on the timing, to that investor group, to that NFT group. That's part one. The second is I I might do something where if anyone invests, let's say two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more. I will airdrop a special NFT to their wallet and that NFT will get them access to my investor meetups that I have twice a year. Amazing. So if let's say we raise uh, $5 million, anyone who invests 250,000 or more or for every 250K, they get an NFT that's access. So someone puts up a million dollars, they would get four NFTs airdropped to them. What does that mean? It means that they have four passes to my mastermind forever with all of the investors and people that I invite, and they get to come twice a year to meet the other investors, to network, et cetera, maybe pitch their deals, who knows. But now they have a choice to make. They could keep all four, or they could say, I'm going to keep one, and I'm going to sell the other three. And they sell the other three to someone who passed on the investment, but they want to be part of the mastermind. So they could sell the other three for 150K each, make back almost half their principal from an asset class that was free for them. So, right. so they have now 50% downside protection, plus they are in the mastermind and they have the equity in the deal. So Ryan, what you're saying is we now just went from what would have been in the past an expense for networking or communication or masterminding it went from a, an expense to basically a potential equity investment. That's really right. cool. Think about how powerful that is, right? Like you got to take a moment of the difference of that, of Amazing. shelling out money to a conference or a mastermind versus buying equity into something that can grow and being able to trade it and transfer it through time. It's amazing. And of course, why would you go to the person you believe like, like all of us, like I know Gary Vee is someone that you really look up to for some mentoring. You're always going to go to the people that you think are best. So why wouldn't you want to invest your time, your money, and your token, and someone that you think is the absolute that's best right. of doing it. That's right. And right? That, that's a, a great way to conclude the point because I asked Gary Vee personally how he would use NFTs and Web3 to build an e-commerce brand. And I was on Zoom with him and asked him this question. 
And he answered how I thought he would, which was that he'd basically create a VIP loyalty program where the more you bought, the the more NFTs you got airdropped to you. Yeah. And then you would have special unlocks for those NFTs. And I will work some sort of that program into each of these brands, assuming the deal goes through. Now, I am I am not sure how that's all going to work, but we'll have some sort of loyalty or VIP program where if a customer spends X amount of dollars with the brand, they're getting an NFT that unlocks special access to something. And that becomes an asset that they can sell or hold on to. Terrific. So, Ryan, we actually did an episode a couple of weeks ago. It might be my favorite episode. You and I went down the rabbit hole that if you were to create a company today, we called it Uber Dow. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) If you were to create versus Uber versus Uber Dow, which would be you were going to create a company today, how you could potentially bake not only financial waterfalls into your blockchain, but how you could do mission, big mission and waterfall. And we went through kind of, we went down the rabbit hole together of what that might look like. Have you thought about, because this is such an amazing company, absolutely everything we've talked about, it's got vision, leadership, clear purpose. It's truly serving a purpose for humanity. It's got everything baked into it to be an amazing, thriving company. So then the question for you I have is, you are a person that has really been transformed, right? And I've been, it's so fun to watch it where Thank you've you. gone from a always, you'll always be a pure capitalist. That's who you are. But I think you're also seeing other dimensions of capitalism. So I can still be this for profit capitalist, but I, but I can still passionately be a passionate entrepreneur that can passionately create mission and service. So I guess the question I have for you, Ryan, is have you thought about how maybe as this company succeeds, how you could bake into the blockchain or early on? whether it's the blockchain or in this company, some of the things that really drive you, which I know is mentoring, tutoring, service, empowering of others. I know these are some of the, the themes of it that that really get, you know, that really turn you on. Have you thought about that at all, what that could look like? I, I've started to. I have not figured it out on the brand side yet, like how we're going to bake that into the brands themselves. But within the way that I will structure the investor group, for example, one option is every NFT has some sort of kickback. So the way that creators are rewarded is every time there's a transaction of that NFT, the original creator is getting some sort of royalty on that. That's what makes all of this possible, what makes the ecosystem sustainable. And you have some control over how big that royalty is and you can do whatever you want with it. Yeah. So one thing that I've considered doing is taking this investor group NFT, which we're calling the capitalist pig. Nice. And the, the, <laughs> the capitalist pig may have a portion of that kickback. Instead of going to me, it will go to a separate wallet that will be used for investments in projects that have some sort of purpose or meaning to me. So that might mean that that's a special account that is reserved for investing in the kid who came from a rough background and has a great idea, but nobody's going to take a chance on this kid, so we will. Yeah. Or it may be the person who just got out of prison and has this great idea for a workout program that he developed while he was in prison. It, it, it would be for people who need a hand up, who, right. who need help. And theoretically, that could be owned by the NFT holders. Right. So there, a piece of the kickback is going to buy other assets that are owned by everybody. Right. So it would be kind of, it could be a Dow like. And it's almost like a way. bonus that you're helping, but you're basically helping. Either it's you're basically helping people that may not have ordinary access to build their own company, entrepreneurs that may not have access, and you're giving these potential entrepreneurs money, some capitalism and support so that they can also have their dream. But the bonus is the NFT holders. Not only would they be investing in all the main stuff, but but they're basically you're, you're helping these these entrepreneurs, but then also the NFT holders, from what I'm hearing you say, would also benefit if, if should some of these companies the, theoretically, right? right. And, and, and just, if they don't, then it was just a, it was just like then in a way you had a great company. It was a community project right. in that case, right? But but all it, it's important to to give a, a the mention here. The legalities and the regulations of all this are not established yet, yeah. And so we are talking a little bit in theoreticals. To our, some of this is not possible yet. It's just what could be possible when the regulations come right. out and say that all this is okay. But there is another angle that could be possible. And I'm actually thinking about it, Ryan, in my real estate right now. You literally could tell your NFT holders when you set the waterfall of how investors will get paid. You could say, hey, you're going to get a preferred return of, let's just make it up. You get a 10% preferred return. So the first 
everything after expenses, the first 10% gets paid to the investor. And of course, the, the GP with the fund or the NFT, I should say. But then you could say the next, and we talked about this in the Uber Dow scenario, that the next 1% of cash or the next fixed amount before we get to the next waterfall will go to a separate nonprofit fund or a for-profit huh. fund. But you literally could declare see, yeah. your waterfall that could do something like that. I'm actually, well, I'll save it for my next show, but I'm working on something really fun that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Something along those lines of having clear waterfalls, but with little breaks in between the first and the second tranches. So you might like, typically in real estate, you'd say, it's let's say it's 10% of a preferred return. And then it's like, 60 to the investors and 40 to us after the 10%. And then let's say it goes to 50, 50 at an 18% total return. And I know I'm going too fast. This is probably the whole thing. But the point is you literally could start to create how investors and how general partners get paid, but you could have little incremental cracks in between it. I say cracks, tranches Mm. to do social purpose that really wouldn't have a major effect on the investment. So if you're, if you're saying, I really think this is going to perform at 20% to the investor annually, well, it might be, I guess you can choose, but may, let's say it was 19.1%, but you're still accomplishing mission. I don't think many investors, Ryan, including myself, that would want to invest in your NFT are going to say um, yes to 20, but no to 19.1. <laughs> and, and and by the way, the 19.1 might become 23 because you've been so innovative and so right. progressive that maybe one or two of the people that you actually believed in became an unexpected That's smashing right. success. So who says... That's even like conventional wisdom. We need to tie it our head that to do good, it has to be a cost. What if what if it's accretive and not extractive, yeah. and it becomes more profitable? And I know this is all just a big experiment, but there's ways you can actually create the waterfall where you can have some fun in the sandbox, where it's not either or, by just setting up the rules right. Yes. I, and I think that's the cool part of what we're taking. We can all experiment together with this. But I can just tell you again from my own experience, and I'm seeing it time and time again. John Mackey at Whole Foods will tell you. I mean, you know, with John Mackey, Whole Foods would have never been as so big if he didn't bake in the mission early on right, to Whole Foods. Right. I know IBM. I mean, some of these large companies see that they are more profitable by simply bringing in that mission much, much earlier into these companies. And and I, I will say the, the mission you helped me, you helped inspire this mission for the Capitalist Pig NFT. Is I got to be a very cute pig, by the way. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing that I'm excited about is I I believe that this investor group that is going to be ready to invest in the startups coming from my circle, it gives the opportunity to ask the question: What does it look like to build a company that is based in abundance from the beginning? So I work with entrepreneurs all day, every day, who are doing it for the money. Yeah, and when you Take the money piece out of it. Like you have to worry about how you're going to pay yourself. When you take that out of the equation and you free up all of that capacity of the entrepreneur to say, hey, we're going to back this with $500,000 because we believe in your vision. What is How much capacity does that free up to be able to create something that has real vision and purpose? Right. And I, and I, and I believe that this opportunity allows entrepreneurs to truly start from a place of abundance because they know the capital is there. Because if my students and my graduates from the incubator know that they're going to have the opportunity to get backed and funded, then they can build a vision from abundance from day one. Right. I love, and I love that we're calling it the capitalist pig. I do too. And, and it's, it's, it's just thumbing our nose at people who are against capitalists. I love it. Cause we're just going to prove them wrong. I think it's just, I think it's excellent. I already, I'm a very visual person having the Sony animation background. I, I, in my mind, I've already animated your capital. It's pretty good. <laughs> good. So anyways, Ron, well, listen, I really, really enjoyed this, this sit down and I'm Thank really you. excited for you. Um, good. It's so fun because to have real live deals, you know, it's one thing if you're a podcaster and you're having a podcast about theoreticals, but to actually have real live deals the way you do in your world of internet marketing and everything that you're seeing. And in my world of commercial real estate, it's so fun to be able to apply these principles and try things out in this experimental times, it's really exciting. So and thank I, you. And I'm thankful that the storm held off. I'm really thankful. <laughs> it was getting close. <laughs> Good to see you, my friend. Thank you. So great to see you.